Okay, so the story of Sisyphus and the Buffalo Bills. Although on the surface these are two very different things, when you look a little bit deeper, these two share one very important detail in common with one another, and that is a very, very unique form of defeat. You see, the story of Sisyphus famously revolves around a king sentenced to eternally push a boulder up a steep mountain, only for it to fall all the way back down, forcing him to restart the process all over again. But each time he fails, Sisyphus simply starts pushing the boulder once again, and the Buffalo Bills in the early 1990s, more specifically from 1990 through 1993, became the only team in NFL history to make and lose four straight Super Bowls. Every single season, they won at least 11 regular season games, and including the postseason, won more games in that four-year stretch than any other team in the league. Even after racking up loss after loss after loss after loss, nothing stopped this Bills team from getting back on the saddle and running it back for another year. So, if you're ready, I'm ready. Let's get into some pain and truly figure out how it was possible for the Buffalo Bills to lose and make the Super Bowl for four years in a row. Before the Bills began to finally win games as the late 80s and early 90s came along, before that, this organization as a whole was a league-wide joke. From 1984 to 1986, the Buffalo Bills had the worst record out of any team in the NFL. But with that comes draft picks. Lots and lots and lots of draft picks. Picking up almost every single important player that you're gonna need to know for the sake of this video from their own pick, starting in the 1983 draft when they grabbed future Hall of Fame quarterback Jim Kelly, who didn't join the team until 1986, but eventually he would become the commander of the Bills offense. And they also picked up linebacker Daryl Talley in that same draft, one of the key future leaders of the Bills defense, so just like that, the foundation was laid for success. Buffalo then continued to add talent through the draft as the years went on, with pro bowlers and some all pros in Nate Odoms, Shane Conlon, Cornelius Bennett, and the Hall of Famer Bruce Smith on defense, as well as two Hall of Famers on offense, because why not, in Andre Reid and the future MVP and running back Thurman Thomas. Pretty much the only guy who Buffalo would have that wasn't drafted by them was former Packers Hall of Fame wide receiver James Lofton. And what this team was about to do to the NFL NFL, it shouldn't have been a surprise to anyone. So they had all of that meat, and I still haven't even mentioned arguably the most important man this team had to offer, and that was their head coach, Marv Levy, who was hired at the age of 62, and with that, we're ready to start the 1990 season, where uh, before the year, uh, head coach Marv Levy and offensive coordinator Ted Marchi Broda used some, uh, some pretty petty strategies to take this Bills team to the next level. You see, in 1988, the Buffalo Bills were a great team. They won 12 games and made it to the AFC Championship game, where they would play the Cincinnati Bengals, led by MVP quarterback Boomer Esiason, and their revolutionary new offense concept, where they would pretty much run a two-minute drill no-huddle offense for the entire game, tiring out defenses, dropping a 28 whopper per game, which was a ton for 1988 standards. Now, the problem was the Bengals would face the Bills in that AFC Championship game, and right before the game began, Marv Levy wasn't having any of these new fancy offensive plays. It breaks the rules of football. How dare anyone defile this holy game? And somehow, <laughs> the NFL actually agreed with Marv and told the Bengals if they ever ran their no-huddle offense against Buffalo, they would immediately be hit with a 15-yard penalty. So, uh, nice. Good, good work, Marv. Well done. So they lost the game by a ton, and then as time went on, <laughs> Marv and the offensive coordinator just decided to yoink the Bengals' entire no-huddle idea and slowly applied it to their own team until finally, as the 1990 season went on, the Bills used an offense named the K-Gun Offense, obviously named after their tight end, Keith McKellar, who was bad. Anyway, the offensive system worked great, but it was heavily demanding, because not only did Jim Kelly basically have to call his own plays every single time, but this offense would just collapse unless every player on the field on their side wasn't in god-tier shape, including their great wall of fat guys who couldn't sub off even once during a drive. So the Bills rode this offense to a dominant regular season, finding themselves holding an 11-2 record, but standing before them in Week 15 was the fellow 11-2 New York Giants, led by the Bill Duo. 
the two Bills and Parcells and Belichick wanted all the smoke. And in this game, I'm, I'm pretty sure at least, Belichick casted a dark spell that traded the life of a Bill for the life of one of their own. With both Giants quarterback Phil Simms and Bills quarterback Jim Kelly both going down with seemingly really, really bad injuries, and more importantly, Jim Kelly was actually just carted off the field. Luckily though, Bills backup quarterback Frank Wright, the current Panthers head coach, outdueled the Giants backup Jeff Hotstedler 17 to 13. But the Giants played well, utilizing a near perfect defensive scheme and offensive scheme leaning on the run to dominate the time of possession battle. I repeat, the Giants dominated the time of possession battle versus the Bills. Remember that in the future. It's it's going to be pretty important. Anyway, although the loss of Kelly for an undisclosed amount of time seemed devastating, and I mean I mean it was, but in the past and even in more recent times, we've seen certain girthed up big men lead their teams to magical seasons, so either team's potential Super Bowl hopes weren't dead yet. Uh, behind Frank Wright, the Bills finished the regular season splitting their last two games, but sealed home field advantage throughout the playoffs with a win versus the Dolphins, so now going into their divisional round against none other than Dan Marino and the Dolphins, all eyes turned to Jim Kelly to see if he could somehow miraculously get healthy enough for this ever important playoff game. Yep, he got healthy. He, he was out there. Jim Kelly was a man who, unless he's shot in all important arteries, it's almost impossible to keep him out of an important game. And the Bills exhausted Miami 44 to 34, looking like they never had any time off at all. Now, although they got that win, the Bills would face a boss they've yet to defeat. The last team standing in their way in the AFC Championship game, this time the Los Angeles Raiders, who in all honesty, it, it, it pains me to say this, but this Raiders team has a great case as the worst team to ever make an AFC championship game. They went 12-4 and on the year, but their one strength was running the f*** out of the rock, relying on arguably the most talented athlete to ever live in Bo Jackson, who unfortunately had just dislocated his hip seven days prior, and that's how you end up with the Bills coming into this game as seven-point favorites, but... God damn it. Not even the most drunk Buffalo fan out there could have possibly predicted the slaughtering, the absolute butchering that took place in this one AFC Championship game. Oh yeah, that man, I love being a Raiders fan. So after that nail biter, the Bills were in the Super Bowl. For the first time in their franchise's history, the Buffalo Bills made it to the big game where their opponent was Bill. Uh, both of them. Again. Now, this wasn't actually too bad, though, because remember, they did beat the Giants earlier this year, even without Jim Kelly for a solid portion of that game, and Phil Simms, the Giants quarterback, was still injured, so the two teams were set to run it back versus one another, with Belichick's spell now seemingly backfiring on his own men. On paper, the Bills were the clear favorites. They simply just had more talent. I mean, Buffalo's 10 Pro Bowlers is much more than the Giants' respectful 7, and, and there's, no, there's not much more to football than that, right? Right? So the game began. Giants versus Bills in Super Bowl 25. And believe it or not, but through the first quarter and a half, fate seemed to be on the Bills' side. They were hauling ass up the mountain, moving the boulder with them, getting some lucky breaks on offense and a free safety after Jeff Hostetler tripped on his own man. So now with 8 minutes and 18 seconds left in the second quarter, not only were the Bills in full control of a two-possession lead, but because of the safety they just picked up, forced sort of by Defensive Player of the Year Bruce Smith, they were now getting the ball as well, giving Jim Kelly and the offense a golden opportunity to possibly permanently demoralize the Giants with an imposing touchdown drive. However, instead the Bills just pissed all over this gift given to them with an Andre Reid drop, Kelly overthrow, and a third down dump off to nothing. The Buffalo Bills just went three and out, burning a grand total of 18 seconds off the clock, playing right into the hands of of the Sith Lord. But once again, the Giants offense just continued to trip over themselves, and once the Bills got the ball right back, it was now someone else's turn to fumble the bag. This time it was the Pro Bowl left tackle Will Wolford, picking up a false start on third and two, which meant their five yard gain on the very next play resulted in a fourth and two, where in the modern age you'd commonly find teams going for it in this position, but I, I guess now wasn't the time. And the Bills punted back to the Giants, this time taking just over a singular minute off the clock. 
Then, as the game raged on, the Giants started to finally move the ball, scoring two touchdowns, one on the final drive of the second quarter, and the second on the opening drive of the third quarter, which resulted in... <laughs> I sh you not. A 9 minute and 29 second drive. The longest drive in Super Bowl history at the time. So now, Jim Kelly, Thurman Thomas, Andre Reid, and the others jogged onto the field with 5 minutes and 31 seconds left in the third quarter. And the last time they found themselves on offense was with 4 minutes and 31 seconds left in the second quarter. Almost an hour and a half of real life time had passed before this team was out there with the football again. And even when they were on the field, Jim Kelly and the offense continued to be stifled by the NFL's number one ranked defense in 1990, with Lawrence Taylor, Carl Banks, and the rest of the crew wrecking things. But eventually, Thurman Thomas ripped off a 31-yarder to the house, and after a Giants field goal, the time had come. New York had just burnt another three minutes off the clock, and with two minutes and 16 seconds left, Jim Kelly took the field for a chance to cement the Buffalo Bills in NFL lore forever. And... On the good side. <laughs> I mean on the good side, I swear. If this was how the Bills were going to win the game, then so be it. Belichick and Parcells could not have asked for a better situation to be in, relying on their defense to win the game, but Thurman Thomas was an issue, ripping off a huge 22-yard run just after the two-minute warning, and now it was time for Jim Kelly to do some throwing. And he basically did just that, finding two receivers for checkdowns, which didn't, didn't amount to many yards at all, but uh, okay, whatever. And then they boldly decided to run the ball with Thurman Thomas and spiked it with eight seconds left, where rather than trying to run another play, they decided to let the chips fall where they may and sent out Scott Norwood, a previous all-pro kicker who was very, very solid, but uh, kicking from a distance wasn't his thing whatsoever, as from just 40 yards and over, 40 yards, he had only made a singular field goal out of his five attempts on grass, and it turns out they were playing this game on the good old green stuff. So with the Super Bowl on the line, all the pressure in the world on this one man, this 47-yard field goal attempt was far from free, and then it happened. Scott Norwood stepped up to the plate, and the boulder rolled all the way back down the mountain. There's a kick! It is up! It is! No good! No one missed! So yeah, that, that's how chapter one concludes, with a swift, strategically placed kick right into the balls. The Giants did exactly what they set out to do, decimating the Bills in the time of possession battle 40 minutes to just 19, but with the dust settled, after the game ended, although Scott Norwood obviously takes a large portion of the blame, so should everybody. Marv Levy could have done a better job with clock management, Kelly missed throws, the receivers dropped passes, and the defense allowed the Giants, led by their backup quarterback still, Jeff Hostetler, to walk all over them in crucial moments, let letting plays like this happen, which, I mean, okay, T to be honest, this was really just impressive on Mark Ingram's part, but, but still, I mean, you understand what I'm trying to say, right? The point I'm trying to make is this was a team. They all felt accountable for this loss, and when they all showed up to work the next day, they all just felt defeated and sad, but Marv Levy knew how to rally his troops, and after posting a poem on the board, that would motivate all Bill's players to run it back and give everything they had for at least one more season. This was the poem that Marv shared with the entire team. Fight on, my men, Sir Andrew said. A little I am hurt, but not yet slain. I'll just lie down and bleed a while. Then, I'll rise and fight again. That was the team's slogan. That was what was flowing through their minds at all times. Nothing but pure revenge. Each player had their own way of getting back to work. Kelly studied, Bruce Smith... He tortured himself with a Stairmaster, and Marv did what he could to keep the guys motivated and hungry for the 1991 campaign. <laughs> Literally, right away, if there were any concerns on whether the Bills could keep up this unique style of offense at a successful rate, all those people who doubted them shut the hell up when in week two, Jim Kelly dropped six touchdowns and a 52 bomb on the Steelers, and from there, everything just seemed to fall in place for this team perfectly. Everything that could have gone right did. Jim Kelly had the best season of his career leading the AFC in passer rating, Andre Reid and James Lofton had great seasons, and Thurman Thomas. Whew. 
That is, that is a bad, bad man. These stats aren't even slightly normal. The dude so often just carried the entire offense when needed, winning the league MVP, Offensive Player of the Year, led the league in scrimmage yards for the third straight season, as well as yards per carry, among other stats, to simply have one of the best running back seasons we've still ever seen. It all just seemed to go perfectly, right? Well, there there were some problems. The castle came crashing down in week six when the Bills got shellacked by the Kansas City Chiefs 33-6, and things got even worse as the year went on, on the defensive side of the ball at least, because Buffalo would be without a few guys. But of course, the most notable human to mention here is, is this thing, the, the Bruce. He was knocked out of action with knee issues from weeks one through four and six through 13. So other guys like Cornelius Bennett and Daryl Talley had to do what they could to hold down the fort while the offense simply outscored everyone to lead the Bills to a 13-3 record and a fourth straight division crown. So it was time for the playoffs once again, and this team was pissed the hell off, obviously, but they still needed to keep their cool and handle business like gentlemen, which they did in the divisional round versus Kansas City, returning their L the Chiefs handed them earlier this year, and now moved on to the AFC Championship, this time versus a more evenly matched opponent from the AFC West the Denver Broncos, a team with Super Bowl DNA already, and now this game had a perfect narrative going for it, the all but inevitable shootout between a pair of 1983 draft picks in John Elway versus Jim Kelly. I mean, come on, there's no way this game isn't just going to be must-watch TV. Well, it turns out this game was must-watch TV if you enjoy watching paint dry, because you'd probably get more entertainment from stabbing yourself with a fork than watching these highlights. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie to you, it was a rough watch. Both Elway and Kelly heavily struggled versus great defenses at full strength, and the Bills who failed to log a single offensive touchdown all game were bailed out by the defense once more getting a pick six and did their best to never look back. However, before it was over, Buffalo did get a little scare when John Elway got injured, backup quarterback and future Broncos head coach, ironically, Gary Kubiak came in and injected life into this dying animal and eventually got the Broncos down the field to bring the game to within three. And then, then the chaos truly ensued when the Broncos whipped out <laughs> whatever the hell this was and actually got the onside kick. Sweet God, the Bills are choking. So with every Bills fan in attendance in a state of shock, Kubiak dropped back to pass, and the Broncos fumbled. Game over, Bills win, Broncos lose. And now, Buffalo had won and was going to the Super Bowl for the second straight year. Except, no disrespect to the Giants from last year, because they were great, but the team that awaited for the Bills this season was, was just a whole different monster. The 1991 Washington Redacteds. This team had everything. An elite defense led by Hall of Famers, an elite offense led by Hall of Famers, an elite kicker, a Hall of Fame coach, and most notably, one of the best and easily the most iconic offensive line in NFL history being nicknamed the Hogs as a reward for their play and... <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately for the Bills, this is where the boulder starts to slip a little. So stay with me, but the week leading up to the Super Bowl, remember, is always just nuts, right? Everyone's getting interviewed everywhere. It's it's just so confusing. But that being said, everyone usually just gives the normal response where you say, oh, we respect our opponent and we're going to go out and do the best we can to try to win the game, right? Well, <laughs> the Bills D-line coach had other plans. This man, Chuck Dickerson, the Bills defensive line coach, went to the media high off of two and a half Xanax bars and blatantly just let it all out, disgracing Washington's entire O-line, talking about how they constantly get away with holds, they're not even that good, and they smell bad, which that's that's just straight up mean. He, he went way too far on that last line. So that's exactly what Buffalo needed, some controversy. But it didn't stop there either, because Bruce Smith, around the exact same time, who had recently worked himself back into football shape, was getting sent racist letters by supposed Buffalo fans. And conspiracies still exist to this day about whether those letters were actually sent by Bills fans. But whatever was said was enough to make Bruce Smith say he might never play another game for the Bills after the Super Bowl again. And this was all before the game began. So to, re to remind you that the goddamn Super Bowl still had to be played, of course the Bills weren't done getting tomatoes thrown at them with the MVP of the NFL, Thurman Thomas, famously accidentally losing his helmet before the team's first possession, forcing backup Kenneth Davis to log a one-yard rush and a Buffalo punt happened soon after. 
And I hate to be the bearer of bad news here, but their luck really just did a 180. Everything that could have gone wrong and more did, and the Bills effectively lost the game before it even began, with Buffalo falling behind 0-17 to before halftime, and then on the first play from scrimmage in the third quarter, Jim Kelly threw a pick down to the two-yard line where Washington would punch it in for a touchdown, and that was basically just it. Washington won the game 37-24 to after Buffalo put up some garbage time points, and the Bills had nobody to blame but themselves. They simply didn't play good enough and looked like the inferior team from start to finish. And although the Hogs O-line later admitted after the game that Dickerson's comments greatly motivated them, I mean, you can't just blame the game on one guy, right? And, and the Bills knew that, and obviously just went into the next season dusting themselves off and hoped that they wouldn't run into another juggernaut because... I mean, what are the chances of that? So all they had to do was just keep reciting that poem to themselves and get ready for round three. But before we get into the third incident here, it's time to talk about this video's sponsor, Underdog Fantasy. Underdog Fantasy, if you're somehow not familiar, is the easiest way to play fantasy sports, and my personal favorite way to do that is through the Pick'em game, where you simply choose whether you believe a player will go higher or lower on a singular stat, and depending on how many you get correct, you can win up to 20 times your money. And for these upcoming Sunday Week 10 games, I've already got three picks right here, which are Derek Carr over one and a half rushing yards, Jalen Warren over over 33 and a half rushing yards, and Justin Herbert over 265 passing yards. So if you want to tail this pick'em entry or come up with your own, and you live in one of these many states in orange on the screen here, then click the link in the description or pinned comment to sign up with promo code TUBFROG, and Underdog will match your first deposit up to $100. And also, if you sign up using my code for the first time, you'll receive a free pick'em offer. And this week, that offer is going to be Garrett Wilson, where all he has to do is find a way to catch a singular ball from Zach Wilson, and you'll be good. So if all that sounds great to you, go have some fun on Underdog, and make sure to use promo code TUBFROG for a huge discount. And with that, let's get back to the pain. To start the 1992 season, although many people had questions regarding... <laughs> Regarding how much more this team could take, the Bills still proved they were at least on the surface the same old Bills, handing the ascending 49ers one of their two losses on the year in a 34-31 shootout, where for the first time in NFL history, there wasn't a single punt from either side. The Bills then proceeded to fall once again to a Raiders team that would finish with a losing record, but if there was one team that was going to have to take the adversity test and pass it, it would be these Bills, who rallied to bring their season all the way back to enter a Week 17 matchup versus the Houston Oilers at 11-4. All they had to do was win this game, and they were in the divisional round. But the football gods had other plans, and in this game and afterwards, the Buffalo Bills would face by far their hardest challenge during this three-year run and counting. And Kelly is down holding his knee. Jim Kelly was hurt, and not only were the Bills going to be without their Hall of Fame quarterback, but they now had to play in the wild card round for the first time since 1981 after that humiliating 3-27 loss to the Oilers, where now waiting for them in the wild card was the team that had just took them and their quarterback out last week, the Houston Oilers. This was it. This was where the AFC Championship dynasty would die. All year long, the Bills offense had continued to show flashes of what it could be, but even with Kelly in charge, it just wasn't the same, as he threw for 10 less touchdowns in 1992 than in 1991, even playing in one more game. And the defensive side of the ball was also allowing around 18 points per game, which with now a backup quarterback in Frank Reich starting for them, was simply not going to be enough to get the job done. And sure enough, the game began and the Oilers just picked up right where they left off, burying the Bills alive in an anticlimactic ceremony of death. And at one point, in the last two games, the Oilers had outscored the Bills 62-6. to And in this wildcard game, I mean, at one point, hold on, can you believe this? The Oilers held a 28-3 lead. I mean, nobody comes back from that lead, especially in the playoffs, so the game was pretty much over. But the Oilers were feeling luxurious today. That stat of destruction wasn't even good enough for them, and they picked off the struggling Reich to take a now inconquerable 35-3 lead. Uh, but, I mean, we still got around another 10 minutes left or so in this video, so... Yeah, thanks Oilers. Real cool stuff you did there. In one quarter, 
One quarter, 28 points were dropped head on the cranium of Houston, and even after forcing overtime, Houston's quarterback Warren Moon threw a pick and the Bills kicked a game-winning field goal to give this Buffalo team a second life. Once again, this team that just barely survived the wildcard round, led by the comeback wizard Frank Reich, who now held the greatest college and NFL comeback ever, were now all of a sudden a Super Bowl contender again. All it took was one small spark of fire, and the Bills just turned that into a bonfire, slaughtering the Steelers 24-3 in the divisional round, with backups Frank Reich and running back Kenneth Davis bawling out of their minds. And now the Bills had to go through the Dolphins in the AFC Championship game. This being their toughest opponent they've faced at this stage in the playoffs, while seemingly the Bills, too, were at their absolute weakest. So the AFC Championship would begin. Marino versus Kelly, and it, it wasn't even close. Although Jim Kelly came back, he really didn't look like his old self, logging a downright rough performance. But luckily for him, Dan Marino was worse, as the Bills' defense gobbled up two picks and four sacks off of Dan, and now, here we are again. The Bills clinched another Super Bowl appearance, but... Although they had just come off of playing some of the most legendary coaches and players ever, things were about to get even harder. As in Super Bowl 27, this guy, this guy, and this guy couldn't wait to have their shot in the spotlight and were prepared to use some brutal force to take the glory for themselves. So here, here's the thing. Remember the 49ers? I mentioned them earlier. Well, if you aren't aware... They're also an NFC team, and in the 1992 NFC Championship game, the Cowboys faced off against the 49ers in effectively what was viewed as the real Super Bowl between the two best teams in the NFL. So, when the Cowboys got the job done, they came into this Super Bowl as six and a half point favorites, which was slightly less than Washington last year, but I mean, that's not saying much because that game didn't go well at all last year, but the point I'm trying to make is the Bills weren't favored in this game whatsoever, but maybe that's exactly where they wanted to be. Bruised and battered, backs to the wall, with nobody in America believing in the Bills outside of their own fans. Now, I want to make it clear that the Cowboys clearly had more talent than the Bills, but Buffalo did have two things. Uh, one, at least this wasn't going to be their first rodeo, and they may have had the potential formula to beating Dallas, which was to simply outscore them. <laughs> I know, what a strategy. But re remember, earlier this season, simply scoring points on every possession was enough to beat the 49ers, so maybe that same plan could work versus Jerry's unit of men, but unfortunately, the Bills didn't collapse before the game like they did last year, but it was a much, much sadder defeat this season because... Despite what seems to be the narrative around this game today, the Bills had clear chances to win this game, but Jim Kelly just didn't look healthy on this day, as after taking a 7-0 lead, taking advantage of a block punt, Jim Kelly would go on to commit three turnovers in three straight drives, and then got re-injured, forcing Reich to try and salvage the broken toy he was handed again, but this time the bag of magic had run dry, and after taking a 31-10 lead in the third quarter, the game was all but decided, and the Dallas Cowboys won the Super Bowl versus Buffalo 52-17, scoring at the time the most points ever in a Super Bowl. How long can this go on for? And somehow, the Bills have just continued to push the threshold of despair even further, with each of their Super Bowl losses somehow feeling less and less winnable. But once again, they simply just ran into an all-time great team, and if they can somehow manage to get back to a fourth Super Bowl, it won't happen again, right? I mean, three years in a row, at least, of running into all-time great teams? That would just be... that would be so unlucky, right? At this point, you know how it goes, the Bills still maintained the same core with their big three in offense in Kelly, Thurman Thomas, and Andre Reid doing the usual thing even with the loss of James Lofton, leading the team to a 7-1 record, including a massive Week 2 win versus the Dallas Cowboys, so, albeit without Emmett Smith, but still, a win is a win, and what this game proved is that regardless of who's out there, 
Like it or not, this Bills team was still a very real threat to win it all. However, they did start to drop a few games here and there, but still managed to finish the season relatively healthy with a 12-4 record. And due to the Dolphins losing three more games than the year prior, the Bills snatched the division crown and held yet another home divisional game versus their playoff punching bag, the Los Angeles Raiders. But let's take a step back here for just a second, though, because with the entire Bills core aging and free agency breakthrough coming soon, this was the Bills' last chance to finally win a Super Bowl. They had bled so much that they simply could not get up any longer. This year was it. And the Raiders, although have been an easy matchup for them in the 90s, the Silver and Black had handled the Bills earlier this season. And in the second quarter of this game, the Raiders looked like they were going to spear the Bills for the final time, taking a 17-6 lead off of the back of their run game. But come on, of course a mere weapon to the heart just pisses off a thing like the Bills even more. And although the Raiders never gave up, a fourth quarter touchdown drive by Kelly and a great late defensive performance by the Bills defense was just enough to exhaust the underdog Raiders out of resources 29 to 23. And then the Bills dealt with another AFC West team standing in their way that they had previously lost to demolishing and injured Joe Montana's Chiefs 30 to 13 to give this team one final chance in the Super Bowl. A Super Bowl rematch. For the first time in NFL history, the exact same two teams would face off against one another for the second year in a row. And for Buffalo, they truly seemingly had nothing to lose. Dallas was once again the up-and-coming heavy favorites, and the Bills were a team that everyone had simply given up on. Once again, the real Super Bowl was 49ers versus Cowboys. I mean, the, the Bills aren't even a real contender. The AFC is a complete joke, and... Although there was definitely some truth to that statement, maybe, just maybe, 1994, and technically the 1993 season, was finally going to be the year of the Buffalo Bills. The team was still holding on by a thread to Marv Levy's inspirational war stories. This team just had one more river left to cross, but the pressure on Buffalo for this rematch seemed to be absurdly high, but in a weird way, because there wasn't much pressure to win the game, more so to not lose. The thought of being known as the NFL team that made and lost four Super Bowls in a row corrupted the Bills from the inside, and they had to do all they could to fight those thoughts all the way until after the game when they could make everyone just shut up for good. And maybe if they needed some more added motivation, Cowboys head coach Jimmy Johnson made the cardinal sin of trash-talking the opponent before the game, possibly by accident, saying Buffalo probably isn't feeling great because they've lost four Super Bowls in a row, but... You know, it, it had only been three at the time, so bold move by Jimmy to say that. And as the game began in the final hour of the Bills' destiny-deciding game, the first 30 minutes went really, really well. Buffalo was in control of the game, and the defense caused a world of trouble for Dallas's offense. And it even seemed like fate was on their side, with the 70-year-old Marv Levy getting knocked down, bled a little, and then got right back up. But uh, for how inspirational that was, even so, the Bills made mistakes that could have allowed them to pull away with a larger lead. A 13-6 lead going into a long halftime break is still very, very solid, and was a shocking development for most people watching this game live. I cannot stress this enough. The Buffalo Bills were in full control of this Super Bowl in the first half, and... Still, for reasons that I can't fully understand, I have my own theories, but I don't get it, the Bills walked into the locker room, and according to sources such as Troy Aikman, who was actually there in person, when the Bills were walking back to their locker room, entering halftime, they, they just seemed tired and sick. Like, they didn't even want to go back out there for the second half. The team was losing motivation by the second, feeling like things were almost going too well for them, and eventually the law of averages was going to set in, and I mean... Even O.J. Simpson seemingly saw it coming. If the Bills were happy with the first half, they certainly didn't show it. Very somber group of guys coming in. There was no talk about great first half. Thank you, O.J. What a truly good and honest man he is. Foreboding, a term used to describe a feeling that something bad will happen seemingly just took over the locker room. And call it what you may, fate, destiny, or whatever... 
but I firmly believe the Bills bought into their own downfall enough to turn it into a reality. All those motivational war stories bestowed upon them by Marv had just started to fall flat all of a sudden. Why would we ever believe in these stupid poems and motivational stories if all they've ever done was brought us more and more pain? So to start the third quarter, on the third play of the second half, Thurman Thomas seemingly drank the Kool-Aid too and coughed the ball up to Dallas, resulting in a 46-yard touchdown. And from there on out, this game was over. Dallas was unstoppable and Buffalo's tank was simply empty, with the Cowboys marching on to their second Super Bowl in a row. And on the other side of the field, the Buffalo Bills did the impossible. Four years in a row, four Super Bowl appearances, and zero Super Bowl victories. And just to try and get more context about what the mentality of this Bills team was during this four-year Super Bowl run, I actually just asked Jim Kelly himself to see how the team was able to stay so mentally tough during this four-year period, and this was his answer. But from your um, uh, notes, it said that uh, you're doing a documentary, God bless you, uh, on the four Super Bowls, and boy, I'll tell you what, those were some fun days, there's no doubt about it. The first one, as you well know, the wide right, it doesn't matter. Scott Norwood was the guy that got us there. So I never would put a point a finger at him or blame him. I should have got a little closer, maybe put on the left hash, whatever the case may be. We did together as a team. And then, of course, going to two and not winning and three. But after the third one, I wasn't sure what my teammates, how they would react. Because all the negativity after that third one, oh, we don't want the Bills back. Yeah, I get all that. But you know, um, going into that fourth Super Bowl, I knew that they would work out. Bruce and Thurman, and Andre, and you know, Will and Ken Hall, and a bunch of the guys, Cornelius. I knew they would work out. I mean, that's what you do for football, you get prepared. But when you hear all that negativity, I wasn't sure going into training camp how the mental part would be, but it took one day. And I knew that these guys were ready. And our motto was, Let's piss everybody off. Let's go back for four. And we did. And unfortunately, as you all know, we didn't win. But we never gave up. The closeness of our family right now, our Bills family, couldn't be any better. We still keep in touch. We still do things together. Uh, I am very blessed that I have some great, great friends, great teammates, and, of course, a Hall of Fame unbelievable coach in Marv Levy. He was the best. He was the greatest leader there ever was. So, Tub Frog, you take care of yourself. God bless you. Good luck on this documentary. The last thing that I have to say as a former Buffalo Bill, let's go, Buffalo. Take care. God bless you, bud. Huge thanks to Jim Kelly for that insight, but in our timeline, after all four Super Bowls concluded, it was now all officially over. Everything was finalized and entered into the history books as Buffalo lied on the floor and bled to death. And to this very day, they have gotten back up, but they just keep getting knocked back down to bleed more and more. The Bills have continued to fall victim to all-time great teams with all-time great talent, so maybe the Buffalo Bills will forever have one purpose in this barren wasteland we call the NFL. And that purpose is to forever push their boulder until they almost reach the top of the mountain, until it falls all the way back down to the beginning, painfully forcing them to restart the cycle all over again. Anyways, if you like this video, then subscribe. And shout out to all my Patreons on the screen here. You can support me. The link is in the description if you want. It's only $1. But if you like this video, then watch this video right here that I just did on every single quarterback that came after Dan Marino and how they all pretty much sucked. It's pretty good, trust me. But anyways, until next time.